The historical old town of Dresden is a mecca for those interested in art and architecture, filled with magnificent buildings such as the Frauenkirche, the Semperoper and the Zwinger. It's an area that is absolutely ideal for a mobile construction crane, due to its narrow winding alleys. Kandienst Kunze sent its Liebherr MK88 Plus mobile construction crane to the old town to replace glass elements in a shopping arcade. Hardly had the hydraulic outriggers been extended when something extremely unusual happened. Complete silence. The diesel engine had been switched off and everything was then carried out using the site electricity supply. The first few hoists were completed from the height adjustable elevating cab to enable the operator to familiarize himself with the site. Then he switched to the remote control. It meant that the job could be completed successfully with maximum safety. Welcome to the first edition in 2022. A Bauma year, of course. We'll be looking in detail in this edition at cranes that operate sustainably, and not just in Dresden Old Town. But we'd like to start today with a new all-terrain crane, or, to be more accurate, a new generation of all-terrain cranes. The LTM 1110-5.2 is the first of its kind. The LTM 1110-5.1 was first launched around three years ago and will be familiar to many of you. And now it's undergone an upgrade, including a new design, new control unit, in other words a new brain, what we call Licon 3, and finally also a new gearbox module. Mark andre you're what Formula One calls a test driver, and you've known about our crane of the future for around a year. How does it feel to you? Of course, it was a very special feeling for me when I was one of the very first people to climb into the new crane. Quite simply because it's the crane of the future, and it's been completely redesigned. Everything was a little unfamiliar at first, because the controls and displays have a new design. But due to the simple and intuitive design created by our colleagues from the control and design departments, you very quickly get used to the whole thing. It's very similar to the Lecon 2. And can you tell us something about what you've been doing with the crane over the past year? The first few days were all about getting the basic functions started. The basics firstly included powering up the control system and being able to operate the initial crane movements in emergency mode. After that, we continued with standard mode. Adjusting to the new controls was absolutely no problem at all. We work very closely with the design departments on these jobs. The basic functions of the control system are now very mature on the prototype. The crane operator will probably not notice any major changes in the functions between the new crane and the Lycan 2. Nevertheless, we of course need Lycan 3, with its faster data bus and large memory, as well as its greater computing power, to enable us to meet the requirements of the future. And we always describe it as familiar, but ready for the future. Do you think that's right? That's definitely right. The whole thing is very familiar indeed. But in some cases, we've made life even easier for crane operators. We've installed a large touchscreen display in the superstructure cab that enables the crane operator to control the crane from a sitting position. More information is also displayed to the crane operator in self-explanatory icon form. There are also brackets for tablets and smartphones, as well as charging sockets for these devices. So, now that you know the crane inside and out, day and night, what's your personal highlight from the whole thing? I can't choose a single highlight, as there are many of them. One major positive feature is the new central locking system. It enables the crane operator to lock all the doors on the crane at the touch of a single button. The central locking system also includes the access lighting in the superstructure cab. This obviously enhances safety for the crane operator as the access route is now better led. Other positive features include the cool box in the undercarriage cab, which we were delighted to test during the summer. A cool drink is always welcome in temperatures of up to 35 degrees. Then there's the automatic climate control system in the superstructure, which only requires us to set the temperature, after which the system takes care of everything. That's great. Thanks very much for your insight, Marc-André. 
And of course, it's not just the design and functions that are new. The crane also has a new gearbox module called the Trexon Dynamic Perform. The main innovation on the drivetrain of the LTM 1110-5.2 is that it's the first crane to feature the Traxxon gearbox with the new Dynamic Perform clutch module. The wet starting clutch transfers the engine power using integral discs, which are cooled by an oil system. This enables multiple starting cycles, even on gradients, and permanent zero-wear maneuvering without the clutch overheating or suffering wear. But how exactly does it work? The principle is a simple one. It's because the clutch is wet. Dynamic Perform transfers the engine power using a cooled multi-disc package, which is immersed in oil. The friction heat generated when the vehicle starts to move is dissipated in the clutch oil and supplied to the vehicle's cooling system by an oil-water heat exchanger. That enables zero-wear maneuvering. And there's another important point. A special function also prevents clutch overheating in extreme load cases and also protects the clutch from the potential wear and destruction which goes hand in hand with this process. Overall, we can say that Dynamic Perform takes the strain off the crane driver. But crane owners also benefit from reduced maintenance costs and lower downtimes. The cooling performance of the Dynamic Perform clutch module has been significantly increased yet again by improvements to various hardware components. Vehicle tests in a refrigeration chamber at temperatures as low as minus 40 degrees have confirmed that Dynamic Perform works very well even in extremely low temperatures, which is why we've decided to install it in all our mobile cranes up to our five axle models in the future. This is one of the largest privately financed infrastructure projects in Europe. The new Terminal 3 is currently being built at the southern side of Frankfurt Airport. Airport operator Fraport is investing around 4 billion euros in the future of Frankfurt Airport. Also involved in the project are the Schick Group and its Liebherr mobile cranes, and 86 Y-shaped supports, which are delivering stability and elegance. Let's take a closer look. The Schick Group was awarded the order for the carcass construction for the new tower, which is an impressive 70 meters in height, and two of the three massive boarding gates. Thousands of heavy prefabricated concrete components are required for the structures. Many of the concrete components will be visible once the pier has been completed, so they have to be designed and manufactured accordingly. The 86 Y-shaped supports on both sides of the structure are especially noticeable. From a support point of view, they're designed to take the load off the floor above them and direct it into the ground. Their architectural feature is their unique geometry. They only feature sharp edges, which run at angles to each other. They were installed using two mobile cranes, an LTM 1230-5.1 and, depending on which one was available, an LTM 1090-4.2 or 1160-5.2. The 230-ton crane hoists the support and holds it in the right position for installation. The smaller crane provides hoisting support until the required angle has been reached by turning the component in the air. All the crane jobs were planned in advance in the office using the Lick-On work planner. Terminal 3 is scheduled to start operating in 2026. Let's return to the subject of sustainability. Mobile cranes are used for various types of work all over the world, in some cases with absolutely no local infrastructure. However, it's quite clear that to achieve our climate targets, we must all make every effort we can together. With this in mind, we've conducted an extensive study into the topic of drive technologies with consultants from Tier Economics. And I'm now talking live to Dr. Ulrich Hammer and Philipp Fedele. Dr. Hammer, what exactly did the study focus on? Well, our aim was to construct an extensive greenhouse gas life cycle analysis of construction machines, focusing primarily on mobile cranes. After all, we know about cranes. We build cranes, we have the technical expertise, and we have the product competence. And of course, we talk a great deal to our customers, so we also know how they use the cranes. But this general economic view, knowledge of the extensive energy considerations and assessments, and also the limitations for these life cycle analyses, that whole thing comes from frontier economics. 
We analyzed what volume of greenhouse gases is emitted by mobile cranes over their entire life cycle. Mobile cranes emit CO2, of course, but on the other hand, they also play a leading role in our attempt to convert to a carbon-neutral economy, as they help to build things which then reduce emissions, such as wind turbines. That means that cranes are absolutely essential for achieving our climate targets. What exactly is behind one of these life cycle analyses? Well, the emissions from a crane whilst it is operating can be calculated relatively easily on the basis of the fuel it consumes. If we look instead at an electric vehicle, it actually emits no CO2. However, if the electric vehicle is powered by electricity generated using coal, all we have achieved is to move the emissions to a different sector. So you have to make sure that you get a comprehensive picture of the situation. That includes energy supply, transport and storage, but also, of course, the crane production process. In other words, we have to include the CO2 emissions for the steel, for example, from extracting the ore, processing in a steelworks and rolling mill, and installing it on the crane. That produces a holistic view from cradle to grave, as we say in the industry. What exactly is behind one of these life cycle analyses? In the first stage, we selected a crane which we could regard as representative for our whole product portfolio. We then studied this crane very carefully to find out how much CO2 is emitted in each phase of the crane's service life. That enabled us to make this holistic assessment. We familiarized ourselves in full with the crane from the point of view of its CO2 emissions. Now we can assess which of the various materials used in its manufacture, or in various scenarios when the crane is in action, contribute to the CO2 emissions from the machine over its entire life cycle. One thing immediately became clear, the main role in emissions is played by the long operating phase, in other words, when the crane is working for our customers. These results, which we know on the basis of the analyses, will sadly not lead to major changes in the short term, but they show us, quite clearly, what we must focus on in the future. Furthermore, not only did we look at the crane, a machine that we currently supply to customers all over the world, but also at machines with alternative power units to enable us to compare these power units from an ecological perspective. The selection of the different power units restricted the possible alternatives for the mobile crane, which can currently be considered from a practical point of view. And what were the results? To enable us to classify the results we obtained for different drive technologies, you first have to create a scale. So we said that we would take the crane in its current form, with a diesel engine using fossil diesel, and use that as the 100% mark. Relative to that, the results show that the greatest CO2 savings can currently be made using HVO, which is exactly what we are doing here at Ehingen. That enables us to reduce CO2 emissions by up to 75% over the full life cycle. If you instead look at a hydrogen internal combustion engine operating using hydrogen produced using current methods, emissions are actually increased as hydrogen is primarily produced using natural gas. Ecologically, of course, that makes no sense at all. We therefore included a scenario in which we assumed that green hydrogen was available. That would enable us to reduce well over half the emissions. Okay, so we've mentioned HVO and hydrogen, but what about battery-powered cranes? The situation is similar if you use a battery electric power unit. If we power a crane using the electricity mix currently available in the world, at the end of the day it does not contribute to reducing CO2 emissions at all. We therefore conducted another calculation, in which we assumed that we would use 100% green electricity. This produced CO2 reductions of over 40%. This clearly shows that the battery production process accounts for a very large proportion of the emissions. Battery electric power units are not a realistic power option today for any mobile cranes, either all-terrain or on large lattice boom models, due to a large number of aspects which cannot be achieved with any sort of priority. The energy density of lithium-ion batteries is comparatively very low. 
To ensure the familiar flexibility in performance, in other words the power of a mobile crane using a battery electric power unit, you would have to install around 20 tons of batteries on the LTM 1160-5.2 that we used in the study for example. This figure alone shows that this situation is completely unrealistic. And it is clear that the technology does not currently provide any potential for universal installation in a fully electric mobile or crawler crane. Does that mean that we're ruling out battery electric as a power unit type and as an energy storage medium for our mobile cranes today? No, at the moment we are not ruling anything out. Naturally, we will be keeping a close eye on this approach as well. We remain open to all technologies. In fact, we have bundled the expertise we have in the company at a Liebherr Battery Competence Center. That will ensure that we remain fully aware of all the developments. Whenever we talk about new technologies, dry technologies in particular, we have to answer a series of technical, application-related and economic questions for every type of use. In other words, for every crane model that we wish to consider. A telescopic mobile crane, powered by using the site electricity supply, should then operate in the same way as a crane with an internal combustion engine. In other words, the electric power unit must always be designed so that site power can deliver the full performance of the crane, as well as the speeds of crane movements and the dynamic of a crane. An approach of this type is certainly conceivable for individual, small, telescopic mobile crane models for which local zero emissions play a role because they are frequently operated within enclosed areas. So what will happen now? Which points from the study will actually be adopted? Since September 2021, we have been fueling our mobile and crawler cranes at the plant exclusively with pure HVO fuel. It has been used for the crane acceptance procedure, the first tank of fuel when the crane is delivered, and for all test drives. Our entire range of mobile and crawler cranes can now be fueled with HVO. Overall, this is enabling us to reduce our diesel consumption in Eingen by around 2.5 million litres per year, which corresponds to around 6,500 tonnes of CO2. And we will be continuing our efforts elsewhere. Since the start of the year, we've been exclusively purchasing green electricity for our large plant in Ehingen. We use electricity generated by European wind power, certified of course, and hope that we are receiving electricity from wind turbines that our cranes have built. That will close the circle. It is a real milestone towards CO2 neutrality. I want to return, very briefly, to the electric crane and give you a little bit of private gossip about what we can expect in the future. This year we plan to bring the LTC 1050-3.1 to market with an additional optional electric power unit with all crane functions powered by an external power supply. This crane features all the familiar usage functions in full. That is very important. So that is a really exciting piece of news for sustainability here in Eingen, and also, of course, for global crane operations. Thank you very much for such a detailed interview, Dr. Hammer and Mr. Fedel. So that's all for today. But we'll be seeing each other again very soon, when we'll be taking you to completely new heights. In fact, right into space. See you then.